uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening to all of you in Abu Dhabi and good morning to our speaker, Professor Panas Cyril Somasundran from Columbia University. I have the honor of introducing him to you today. Professor Somasundran received his MS and PhD degrees from the University of California, Berkeley. After five years with the International Minerals and Chemical Corporation and Reynolds Industries, he joined Columbia University faculty. In 83, he became the first Juan Dertelson Crumb Professor. In 87, the first director of the Langmuir Center for Collides and Interfaces. And in 98, the founding director of the National Science Foundation's Industry University Cooperative Center. He was inducted in 1985 into the National Academy of Engineering, the one of the highest distinctions for an engineer in the US. And in 2016, to the National Academy of Inventors. He was appointed to the EPA Board of Scientific Counselors in 2014 and as chairman of its Chemical Safety and Sustainability Committee. He was awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor in 1990. Dr. Soames Honors International. He is an elected member of the Chinese National Academy of Engineering, the Indian National Academy of Engineering, the Russian Academy of Sciences, the Academy of Mineral Technology Sciences. In 2010, he was elected the Foreign Fellow of the Royal Academy of Canada. In 2010, the President of India awarded him Padmasri, which is one of the high civilian honors. He's honorary professor at Central University of Technology of China and in Beijing Research Institute of Mining and Metallurgy and University of Melbourne and Indian Institute of Science, etc. Some have been concerned with a wide spectrum of environmental problems, including chemistry, pollution control and remediation, control diseases in personal care products sludge and wastewater treatment, and now rising very quietly to the occasion with the decontamination of viruses to control corona. Dr. Som is the author and editor of 15 books and some 700 scientific publications and patents, and also editor of Encyclopedia of Surface and Cloud Science and honorary editor-in-chief of the International Journal of and Surfaces. He has served on many national committees, including the National Research Council panels, National Science Foundation, Department of Interior, Department of Energy, National Institute of Dental Research, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences advisory panels, etc. So I have the great pleasure of, um, of uh, welcoming Professor Somasundran to speak to us today about space exploration and extraterrestrial mining. And he will tell us about the importance of the subject. So it's all yours now. You are, you are muted. How about now? Can you hear now, me? Now it's good, yeah. Oh, okay. Good day to all of you. I was saying it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to Abu Dhabi Institute in Kerala, where I was born, is a dream for everyone to spend time in Abu Dhabi and nearby areas. They go and make a lot of money and come back and build mansions in Kerala with the marble tiles and everything in the bathroom. And then they bring their grandmother, they don't know how to walk and they fall down and break their legs. So you, have a lot of uh, mansions in Kerala. It's a beautiful state. I never realized until I left. As Rini really knows, I grow, I, it is green from, from top to bottom. It's, uh, it's beautiful. Now I, enjoy, now I really appreciate it. So I thank you for this opportunity. So this is a course that I gave at uh, Columbia. Uh, it's a semester course compressed into one hour. So I did not go into the details. I got into space because of passion. Passion is what is important for you to succeed in any field. I haven't succeeded yet, but I'm passionate about it. 
with all the things that are happening uh, in various countries, China, India, India a little bit behind, but they're all advancing. So I'm very, very glad. I am in the, originally I am in the mining and mineral field where I got the degree from Indian Institute of Science and then from University of California in Berkeley. But in space mining, it's very different because most of the techniques that work on the earth will not work on the, in the, uh, under microgravity conditions. And that's what I am going to be emphasizing in the last half. Discuss some of the techniques that are used in the, on the earth, and then how do you modify it? That's where the challenge. How do you modify it for use under microgravity conditions? That is really uh, what is still to be solved. So one reason for going into space, there's infinite resource in space, and in terms of sustainability, it's there forever. But we have to design the, the operations for minimum damage to the environment, and we have to do it now because we have, we have messed up the earth, the planet. The Lord is angry at us and he will warn us with all kinds of disasters, floods and everything. But now when we start to do things in the space, it's important to design the operations now. Already there's a lot of space junk there and I'll come to that. In fact, one can mine that junk because it's all metals and materials and good stuff. So we have messed up the, the planet Earth. Now we have to make sure that we don't mess up the, the universe, this universe too. It's happening. Space junk is so much, which is, can be a source for mining. So why do, we, why do we want to go to space? There is a book by someone about the inhabitable Earth, uninhabitable Earth, because life on Earth may become bad enough and the technology good enough to travel. And there is population growth, toxic environment, social disparities. Now they are saying here, there may be even some um, civil disobedience problems in this country. Uh, by the way, Dr. Srinivas introduced me very well, but he forgot to say my claim to fame is that I was fired by Trump. A lot of myself and all the scientists were fired by Trump when he became president. And it came in newspapers and ABC, NBC, they all came to interview. We never got so much attention until he fired. But whatever I quoted, the New York Times only wrote the good part for some reason. I said some diversity was necessary. Diversity meaning we were all mostly academic people in the in the EPA board. There were no industrial and business people. I also believed that this was diversity, and I mentioned that. That's what New York Times printed. And I think I be, I, my uh, friend in the White House called me, you're a hero here. So when they reappointed three people, I was one of them. So I'm still in the board and Biden came and I'm independent. I'm not a Democrat or Republican. So I'm still in the board. So that's my claim to fame. So uh, the reason for going to space, life on earth may become bad enough and technology will be good enough to travel. And as I mentioned, the need to get away due to population growth, due to toxic environment, social disparities. And now they say even robots will, will drive us ever. And traveling like this is not anything new. We started from East, uh, East Africa, in the Rift Valley, we uh, it's where it all began apparently. And then we traveled North and which helped develop all kinds of technology, even the clothing and everything, because it was colder when they traveled North. So, it's not anything new, but then more recently, pioneers like Columbus took unknown journeys, not for fun, but for profit. And same thing with UK also, colonizers like 
in the UK came and brought back values to Britain and they all became lords. They really robbed. And uh, Shashi Tharu, MP will tell you that it, India's GDP used to be 25% growth or something. It came down to 2.5, but now we are coming back up. So this is not anything new. And uh, when, when there's a need and when there is a, um, passion, we can do it. And more importantly, as shown at the bottom of the slide, the, the in space, there are values, mining of diamonds. And for energy, helium-3, a lot of helium-3, and I'll come, to back, come back to this. When mining of diamonds, so my wife said, hey, this is something, you know, she likes diamonds naturally. This is probably the only thing that you ever did that is good, this field. So go and mine some diamonds in astro asteroids. So there's a lot of value in space mining. NASA, for example, has marked several asteroids, but mainly one asteroid called 16 Psyche, worth more than 10,000 quadrillion dollars. When you compare to the economy of our planet, which is 80 trillion, you can see enormous. This gold, iridium, diamond, silver, palladium, platinum, all these platinum group metals, and tungsten for mining and transporting back to Earth. And you probably know all this, some of the many, many of these uh, introductory things, but let me say it any, anyway, because it's important to have a proper foundation. And then there are other materials such as iron, cobalt, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, and all those things for construction uh, right there, because to haul it from Earth to these planets, it takes a lot of energy. So that is the reason. And so it's said that the trillions of dollars in space resources, the first trillionaires will be space miners. So that is that is where students also get interested. This is something they found in one of the craters in Moon, found a while ago, but it came again on the Yahoo News yesterday. I showed you number 13 today, is 14, I think. So I took a picture of that. That is also a valuable material there. And then there is helium. Helium-3 is implanted in many of the minerals. Helium-3 is highest in mature regolith. Regolith is the soil on this planet. They call it regolith. And maximum in ilmenite, il il worth about $15 billion per ton. Worth, worth, it's worth shipping all the way to the Earth because it's, we need energy. But it costs transport to uh, Trans, it costs transport of mining equipment and crush the agglutinates. They call it aggregates, agglutinate, beneficiate, they eliminate. And then you heat it. You heat it to generate low temperature processing to get helium-3. The fines are sticky and difficult to separate. That is still a challenge. A lot of these processes that work on the earth that I'll come to in a, in a while don't work under microgravity conditions in vacuum. That's where the opportunities is for uh, the Abu Dhabi Institute as well as New York and everybody to, to produce. And there are a lot of industrial metals in planet, boron, carbon, magnesium, titanium, all the ones that you would like, molybdenum, lead, and all these. So space mining, where do we want to go? Well, there are a lot of places one can mine, Moon, Mars, Titan, Jupiter, planets, asteroid. Moon is actually a part of Earth, so really you don't get many precious materials there. But once you get astro 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 asteroids, uh, some of the asteroids are just full of Earth. And there are so many planets out there, Europa, Callisto, my favorite, Angelida. I like the Spanish Angelida. So Angelida there, and Triton, Titania, so many of them outside the Earth. In addition, of course, you have the, I, these are the ones with metal. See, I put there, the metal there. And all of them, there are metals. Mars, also some, but not as much. Moon is, as I said, part of Earth. 
but not much metal. There is some, but these have a lot of metals there that one day one might uh, want to travel there to collect. And how to get there? Well, you have seen all these rockets and the most recently the SpaceX rockets. So these are all there. But then in, to, to Mars, it takes a long time. But now using thermonuclear engine by fusion, you can get to Mars in three months. So if they take me, I used to say that I'm too old, but now the the one of the Star Trek per, person who's 90 year old went and came back at least to the low, lower Earth limits. So I tell my students who are in, young enough should sign up and go. If they will take me, I will go, you know. I don't know, I have a daughter here called Tamara. I have to make sure that she is settled. So I am prepared to go, which is really uh, great. And then intergalactic transfer, tra transport, you have heard of the warp speed. Here is the black hole and white hole. And so this is what is known as the wormhole. You can, in, in theory, in theory, not in practice probably for a long time, you can go through this and it takes time or you can take a shortcut. So this is how you can get to. Now, asteroids, as I mentioned, is the most uh, uh, precious metal containing planet near the Earth. And there are all kinds of asteroids, stony, stony water rich and the carbonaceous, but the metallic is about 5%. And the platinum, which is uh, about 1%. Platinum is even more costly than gold. When I went to South Africa, I bought a platinum ring, thinking that my wife will be impressed, but it didn't look like gold, you know, for, in, for India, gold is important. This is so you can write on your, I'm wearing platinum. Anyway, there's a lot of platinum there in the in, in asteroids. And mining the near Earth asteroids is where the where the opportunity is. There are a lot of them waiting there. Um, and the technology to get them is already av available. But as I would mention shortly, many of the processes that work on Earth will have to be modified. So so the technology, but the technology, basic technology, basic principles are there. But as you know, asteroids can also be a threat. Many times they call, they say there are there's an asteroid coming towards us, but NASA and others can detect it. We think, but on the other, on the other hand, the other day they said there one passed by. They didn't even know. So, so there is always a danger of the impact of the asteroids. And uh, a lot of products from asteroid mining, silicates and all these things can be also useful because they can be used in shielding from radiation, water and other volatiles for use in space, but also to use propellant. All these metals, but also platinum group metals, PGM stands for platinum group metals, they are costly and they are very precious. Even now, there's a lot of effort in South Korea. There's a lot of platinum, platinum group metals, but not much in this country or uh, uh, in in uh, India. And they are important for catalysts for fuel cells, and as you know, for platinum converters in car and water. Water can be used as propellant for return trip. In space, market for raw material is not yet a reality, but when it is. There it's going to be a lot. But all the mass used in space and originating from Earth cost at present about 10,000 per kilogram to launch. So to take materials from Earth to planets and so on is very costly. That's why it's important to uh, have processes that you can uh, make materials from Mars and so on. In Mars already, when I was at the Institute of Science last year for a month, I worked with uh, Professor Alokuma, Alokuma. They have uh, products or developing processes used by which they can make uh, things from the soil using 
bio products using 3D 3D building. So that's happening slowly, but that is there. So that is important because as, as I showed here, it was about 10,000 uh, pounds per kilogram to launch. And so it's very, very important if we can set it there. And so, so what's asteroid? Asteroid, how do you collect it? How do you process it? So there, many of them are weakly bound rubble pipe or fragments. So how do you how do you collect it? There's one book recently that I read where you put a net around it so that all these fragments are in contained. Then you transport it to a nearby colony station where you can process or bring it to Earth. Some of them, if they are very precious. So it is not easy. You know, you have, you have heard recently a Japanese uh, um, spaceship went there to collect the some sample of the asteroid, but they could not close the the latch properly. So they were they were going to lose all of it by the time it comes to the Earth. So finally, they, they after they left that asteroid, they were able to close it. So it's very very important still be able to. Uh, handle this, um, this this pile, and some of them are solid. So some of them are not so, but the some of the precious ones are are fragments. So these are still technology we will develop how to process it, and then this is the schematics of how you can mine. This is a satellite waiting there. You can go and mine it. There's another one. You can just go and collect it using this hopper into an international satellite station and then process it there or a nearby processing station, or sometimes you may have to uh, bring it to the earth. So there's a lot of conceptual things still, a lot of technology still to be developed. That means opportunities for Abu Dhabi Institute, Columbia and uh, all of the Columbia, there is no space institute yet. All the other major universities do have. So that is the opportunity there. And how do you mine? There are the various ways. I will go into just a couple of them. Most something that doesn't depend on <coughs> gravity is of course optical mining. So here, so what you do is you go there and burn the material and create a space and then suck it out. And then you can process it. So this is completely based upon optical technology and and uh, burning technology. So there's no gravity or anything involved. So that should work pretty well. But as I mentioned, because it's a ro uh, ro pile of things in, on, on um, uh, asteroids, there are a lot of problems to be solved. You have to anchor. On, under micro, into microgravity body, combination. Combination is a word that uh, we use for grinding or crushing. Crushing is more commonly known to make particles smaller so that you can leach and get materials out. And ground control is very important even in microgravity conditions. You know, these things are far away. And containment of product cuttings, as I mentioned, uh, that that Japanese instrument has a problem in closing the closing their uh, uh, latch. So that is that is containment is important, and then handling of cuttings through the processor, and then separation and storage of product. Most important is how do you adapt the techniques that have been used on Earth for 50, 100 years, but under gravity conditions. How do you adapt? I'll come to that. That's where I spent like to spend uh, um, last half discuss some of the techniques that are promising. How do you modify it? That's where the challenge is for the Space Institute and others. Not much work is going on. There's some going on at Colorado School of Mines, but in terms of actual separation and storage, really not much work. So what is needed actually is a mining plan based off on accurate ore body model. And since this all have been done very well for Earth, 
it should be not be very difficult to adapt it for moon and others but there is a vacuum dust is hard to uh, contain dust and uh, and it optimize the recovery capital expenditure operate operating expenditure payback time all these things have to be calculated and optimized and not these are all not done yet to a great extent a some attempt by nasa and some but not really much so i'm suggest citing these things these are the op research opportunities development opportunities there are many mining methods I'll briefly look at them surface reclaimed snow blower that's accepted there's advantages shown here disadvantage is there problems with anchoring and the surface will be desiccated and solar bubble vaporizer for the time being is rejected because it's unacceptably high membrane tension and how do you seal and anchor by the way i think uh, i don't know that i told you i you can raise your hand and ask me questions and stop in between i think uh, camera that facility is there right i think they should be able to ask questions I think, uh, they put questions in the <clears throat> chat box and i will uh, read them out to you towards the end Oh, towards the end. Okay, in between yeah. this urgent clarification required, let me know. Sure, they can raise their hand, yeah. Okay. Yeah. In situ volatilization, that has not been accepted, that is rejected for the reasons that you need membranes and uh, processing equipment of low permeability, the risk, risk of loss of fluid, clogging and blowout, explosive disaggregation, there's potential things to be worked out. Advantage is uh, very rapid release but capture of material is still unsolved. Then downhole jet monitoring, rejecting, rejected, is well used on earth. Mechanically, therefore it is simple. It separates mining from processing tasks. On earth is done at in fact, different sites very often, but it is rejected because you need gas to transport cuttings to process and blowout risk is very high. Underground mining by mechanical mode, there's a lot of experience on the earth for the last 100, 200 years. So, and reduced anchoring and containment problem is physically robust. Disadvantage is mechanically severe, hard to monitor from all the way from earth and must remove cuttings to surface plants so that it, get, it doesn't get damaged. So, first, a little bit about mining as I mentioned, I like to spend most of the time to discuss the techniques that are used on the earth and how to modify. So very briefly, mining the lunar dust uh, from fine dust. The first you use bucket, almost like the, on earth, the bucket wheel moves regularly. Regularly again is the soil, as you all know, I'm sure. Soil on the earth is called regolith into a lifting belt to, to sift out large stones and keep only the grains smaller than one meter one millimeter in diameter then you fluidize it that's because you need to fluidize to transport it it moves all large particles and then you heat it well, heating is important because by moderate heating you can also generate he, uh, important gases such as helium helium-3 and other gases released from the regolith. And then the gas can be storage, uh, especially the helium-3 and other gases transport to moon base or even to the earth because helium-3 is very, very important. So this is just a conceptual diagram for the mining the lunar dust. So lunar versus terrestrial problem. In lunar, there is almost no atmosphere gravity fragment dispersal problem is large and that has to be contained to avoid damage to equipment and nearby folks so design and place explosives to reduce scattering because in on earth you use explosive to to uh, scatter uh, to uh, to collect material to break material but there on planets here to make sure this is not scattered much and gravity is going to or lack of gravity is going to affect 
excavation, loading, and holding of loose material. I would say lack of gravity is going to be so. There are, so there are, these are some of the conceptual mining techniques. There are many. I used only a few. Uh, it's called something called lunar slasher. It's not water, but using other materials. Uh, it's mined, and then it is moved into something that you can pump of fluid using other materials and then using and then you bring it to a module mill. It's called lunar slasher. Now there are use, other uses of the moon that we should not forget. There is energy from solar power, 24 hours. There is solar power available. Uh, it can also serve as space stations for tourism, for going to other planets. The research and astronomy possibilities are tremendous once we develop bases there. Of course, telecommunications stations uh, that will make the data traffic will grow a lot. Moon gravity factories that can make exotic alloys under low gravity conditions. You can make special proteins, crystals, plasma, pharmaceutical drugs, and so on that need high vacuum for clean rooms for microelectronics, that's going to be easy. And even if they, they imagine you can have shipyards for uh, making, it, making transport materials to go to Mars for robotic mining and so on, then lunar liquid oxygen can be used uh, to extract then hydrogen from polar ice. Lunar observatory labs and orbital space settlements and spin-offs for clean energy Artificial intelligence had to be developed for that. And movie makers, you can imagine, movie makers are going to be there first to make movies. There are a lot of other uses of moon. So Mars, if with, even though Mars doesn't have as much resource as all, almost all the asteroids, they also have resources that are vital for supporting astronauts. So and instead of launching resources such as water and materials to build habitat from Earth, because it's very, very costly to escape from Earth's gravity, which is the highest compared to Moon and so on. So more of cost effective for before we even go there to send robots to harvest resources from the Martian surface to preparation for the moons. But as I mentioned, there are tech people who are working on uh, using uh, 3D 3D techniques and Martian soil and biosurfactants. You can make uh, the the uh, the setup that is required to make this. So NASA wrote once that uh, this abundance of resources already in Mars, Mars, and we are on the cusp of developing the technologies to extract resources on Mars with robotic system and, and drones. So there are techniques there, but not really completely developed yet. Now, there are some problems. There's no water, there's a dilemma. There's no oxygen, food. Now it looks like we can grow the food there with sunlight there 24 seven, and then shelter and clothing. That has been solved by and large, but it's but clumsy clothes here to wear all the time. And that's one good thing on Titan. You don't have to, the temperature is perfect that you don't have to wear this uh, suit and everything. So, but the need four things on Earth, on Mars in addition, you need oxygen. These four things you need in, on Earth also, in addition, oxygen. So Titan, Titan, the good thing is that the conditions are best in terms of the gravity. Uh, Mars, Mars is not as compelling as long-term human destination as as uh, Titan, Saturn's moon Titan. Why Titan? Because it is thick atmosphere with about 1.5 times the surface pressure of Earth atmosphere. Let me ask uh, Amaro who's listening, am I going too fast? Um, not from my point of view. Oh, I don't okay. Want... If but you, but you wouldn't know either. See, Indians have a tendency to speak very fast, and there's a reason for it. If anybody complains, I tell them, look, 
our life expectancy is very, very short. We cannot fool around like you folks. You have to, you have a lot to accomplish in a short time. So we speak fast. I remember when I came to Berkeley, my professor couldn't understand a word I said. He said, slow down. Still speak fast, but not as fast as when I came. But if I am speaking fast, you know, raise, raise your hand and ask me to slow down. Um, so why Titan is a thick atmosphere and it's the only place in the solar system other than Earth is stable surface liquids. They say you can even um, you can even swim and everything on lakes. If it's not water, it's other liquids. Uh, but you can develop appropriate uh, uh, suits and uh, you can even swim. But if you, have, you don't have to wear bulky pressure suits while you are out there. And uh, because the main reason is atmosphere will help us stay alive there. The damaging particles cannot make it to the surface, so it's much more safer. But however, the temperature is very, very low. So one has to have the appropriate uh, um, clothing. And the gravity and everything is such that people can walk, ar walk around or rather bounce around because gravity is lower. It is cold on Titan, of course, minus 290. So clothing has to be appropriate and people will need to wear respiration in some cases because atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. So you need oxygen. You know, I believe that it is possible to develop, even though a lot of people would be against it, develop ourselves our DNA technology, so that we can live on, live by breathing other things than oxygen. But that is, they're not there yet. I think not, not much research going on. The light on Titan is just, just like after sunset on Earth due to haze particles. So that is all, these are all very nice things on Titan, but there are also, also problems. The hydrocarbons, a lot of, Titan is full of hydrocarbons, and these are ready source materials for building plastics and and uh, habitats out of the plastics. Humans could burn methane. That is plenty. In fact, the lakes that I talked about is sort of all methane lakes, liquid methane, to produce energy. Perhaps using nuclear reactors to power, power electrolysis of water. A lot of a lot of now grow, growing food. You know, on all this Mars and so on is a problem. Growing food using our crops not be efficient, even the lower solar flux, not as much sunlight. But I think we should be able to um, develop the plants that can do much better under low photosynthesis conditions. And that is that's what going on. I already shown that on moon and so on, plants can grow very well. Uh, humans on Titan will need biotech and not traditional foods. Um, they can invoke some type of artificial photosynthesis and maybe eat some hybrid algal food. I don't know. I'm, so the, for that reason, I may not want to go, but otherwise I'm prepared to go. So these are the problems. Now I would like to get into the separation techniques that will have to be modified. Let's see how you are, we are doing on time. Uh, I think it is. You can go on for another 20 minutes, I guess. Okay. Uh, these are the separation techniques that are used on the earth. And this is where the opportunities are, where the Abu Dhabi Institute and others you have to modify this for using under under a moon or anywhere. There are processes that are used without chemical change, with chemical change, and without chemical change. I would prefer without chemical change because when you use chemical changes, when you use pollutants and uh, cause problems. But in many cases, like producing aluminum, silicon, you have to use furnaces and chemical change. Without chemical change is what is what is preferred. I put it in green because that's more benign. So this is this is very clear screen. That is very simple. But 
uh, here on earth you collect this using gravity and i'll show you in a moment so you have to use some other process by which by vacuum or suction something like that by which to collect particles so and then you have to separate the values from the junk and that's where the challenge is especially on, under microgravity conditions on earth it's based upon size and gravity size we can still use as long as we can develop equipment to collect they'll come to some of it the most popular is based upon flotation and i'll discuss that for flotation based upon wettability of particle are particles going to be wetted by water or not and there are surface charge techniques which are more possible on planets because it doesn't depend upon gravity as much electrostatic magnetic properties these are more possible it's not as much used on 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 earth as flotation flotation has been used for hundreds of years and for millions of tons but on flotation has problems i'll show in a moment um, but so these are more possible electrostatic and magnetic so this is separation by size this is called a trommel a trommel this is holes and so you put material fed here and small uh, the uh, let me see the small the coarse particles will come here and the small particles come here and they fall under gravity so in space again you have to have some kind of system that will collect these materials that and by uh, that fall out of the screens and so on but that should not be a big problem i think now this is that something that is used in earth a lot i don't think the the uh, I usually I can run it. Something comes through here, the green, and the coarse particles are blue, and the and the light particles are yellow. And in cyclone, they go and hit the walls, and separation takes place into heavy particles and light particles. So the field is green, small particles coming up, coming out on the top and large particles coming at the bottom so it depends mostly on hydrodynamics fluid dynamics and but also gra gravity so this is one technique that we have to modify for use under microgravity conditions now another technique as i mentioned is for flotation which depends upon capillary 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 rise i'll show you in a moment how do plants get water all the way up there that's by capillary rise. That will show you in a moment. And in here, if you have a white daffodil, you put the, the, the cap, by capillary rise, if you put a capillary here, water will rise due to something called Laplace pressure. I, will go, I won't go into that. By the way, there are all the courses, most of the courses that I teach and everything at Columbia, people can take from anywhere in the world using video network. Uh, anyway, what is interesting here that I want to show you is a white daffodil. If you have blue liquid, blue liquid will rise by capillary and become blue. In fact, you can split this stem into two and put one in pink and one in uh, 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 red, and you get a multicolored daffodils because half of the stem will suck the blue and half of the stem will suck, suck the so multicolored. This is also used to make multicolored roses that, that you see sometimes on the road as well. And this is easy to make by capillary rise. And that is used in in on Earth. Most popular, thousands of tons or millions of tons every year used using something known as froth rotation. But you do use crush, you crush crush the the uh, the earth material and put it here and stir it stir it like hell and uh, and then you pass air bubbles the particles that are hydrophobic or water hating it's really a misnomer doesn't nothing hates water it's just like it likes water more uh, uh, oil more than water but hydrophobic is the word used uh, wrongly used so the bubbles will stick to the hydrophobic material and it will rise to the top you get levitated and you can collect it here and the hydrophilic particles 
will stay here. And this is used, there are many, many machines available. As I mentioned, it is used in, on Earth for millions of tons, or for, for hundreds of, 100 years at least. And this is easy to, easy to use anywhere, except under microgravity against the problem. This is to show that the hydrophobic particles are attached to gas bubbles, or this could be oil droplets, and hydrophilic stay out. So that is how you stay, stay separate values from junk. Or junk also can be collected. If you are interested in pollution treatment by this oil or, or water droplets, this is a good technique. But notice that this depends upon gravity. So it won't work. And, but astronaut Glenn, Senator Glenn, did some experiments at that time. By, uh, you know, when I gave this uh, lecture, a student on the video network asked me, but my gravity is not going to work on the, on the Earth. So how do you use? I just happened to have some photographs taken by Senator Glenn, and that shows, for example, this is water here and oil collide with the dye under Earth. This is just a, a something to, to follow the material. So, so what happens in the in the in space? The experiments that uh, uh, he somebody designed for him and he did. Can you imagine this long back in the very first uh, uh, trip that Senator Glenn took? What you see is that material separates on the basis of wettability rather than gravity. It is a plastic container. Oil is going to wet the plastic container. So oil goes to the outside and, and water is inside. So using wettability technique, which still has to be developed a lot for microgravity conditions, it, it can be done. I think the next slide, no, I thought the next slide shows if you have water, uh, a glass, glass container, the water will go to the outside and oil will stay inside. So rather than gravity, the separation is controlled by wettability. So this is something that can be done a lot. Okay. That can be modified, but there is an opportunity. This, this means there is an opportunity for you and for us, for all of us to develop techniques. You only know that there's a principle that can make it work. Now, of course, there are some techniques that, that use on Earth should work as is magnetic, that doesn't depend upon gravity as much, but not everything is magnetic. Only magnetic material can be collected like this by magnetic separator. On Earth, crushed material is go over, over a plate and the magnet is a magnetic roller. Magnetic material is stuck there and it will fall here and the non-magnetic will fall here. Now, they fall by gravity. So again, on planets, you have to or some kind of system by some kind of um, sack or something and you collect it by vacuum. So that's not that's not very very difficult. But so these techniques, both gravity and uh, magnetic ma magnetic, I mean magnetic technique and techniques that are dependent upon electric electro electrical conductivity of materials. It's called electrostatic separation. These are all used. Equipments are available on Earth already, but so these are used if material is magnetic for the previous technique or conducting for electrostatic electric. So if material is conducting, what you do is you subject it to uh, electrical, shall I say, shock, and then particles that are positive will be collected here positive that are particles that are negative will be collected here. Then on a, on a belt, whoops, on a belt, uh, on a, if, if you put it on a belt, then you can easily use this technique. So not much problem. So these are techniques that you can easily use, but they have to be conducting or, or magnetic. Now, in I am most excited about microbial techniques. Microbes, you can grow them on the on the planet. Here is a picture of uh, Thiobacillus, uh, Thiobacillus fraxidens. We have done a lot of work with it. They are very happy around gold. I call them lady micro, lady micro get in trouble. And they eat the flower, and you can see gold particles 
So these microbial techniques are, it is most prospect for use on planets. And here it shows how microbial tech, microbial reagents work as opposed to conventional reagents. Here, uh, I compare the, the, the traditional recovery of copper as a function of magnesium recovery. So this is what you get. Bacteria products are only used, but you use bacteria, santate. Santate is a, is a reagent that is used in preparation. So, but if you mix both, see, it's very good. We have a project at Columbia or a stream of project where we mix, mix the reagents because mixing, with mixing, you have to use less material and uh, more efficient, not for everything, but uh, for appropriate, appropriate works. And as I mentioned, microbes, my favorite. Here is my, here is a microbial development around old uh, particles and also in Yellowstone here, thermophile heat loving microbes present in yellow, Yellowstone, so they grow. As soon as you provide some kind of food, they will grow and you can make them so that they will attach to one mineral and not the other. In other words, they will attach to the valuable material, but not to the rock. So the other source is space junk. So, uh, Sini, how much more time? Camera. Anybody there? Anybody there? Anybody listening? Listening? Tamara, <laughs> Srini, how much more time? I am. Hmm? I just keep going. Stop me when I ask me to shut up when I have too much time. Now, this is something that is ignored. But there's a lot of good material, space junk. There's a lot of material out there. Space debris, debris is increasingly of concern. And the collision of collision is the big problem. You may have read that yes, um, during the last couple of days, the space station was going to hit some debris from uh, some, some Chinese rocket, and they are going to serve the ship away. Yeah. That's an alarm that I set up for myself. Okay. Uh, now, there's a lot of material there. It's estimated that there may be around a, close to a million objects uh, larger than a centimeter in size. So there's no reason why we cannot go and, and mine that and uh, uh, mine that material. And here is the earth. All these materials are there for us to clean up as well as when you clean up to collect, to make uh, metals and everything there from that. And, and out of our very good material, for example, this is something that space station tossed away, 2.9 ton, ton hung of space junk. They just threw it over overboard. So some of the things that they throw it overboard, you don't want to touch it. You know, they are uh, screeched and so on, on but they will degrade. But these, these are there to be collected and used as a source. So to, I think I used quite a bit of uh, time now. So my concluding remarks, I went over, over, all, over all these things in a rather hurry. As I mentioned, my life span is short. I have to do all these things in a hurry. <laughs> That's a joke. You can always joke about me, if not about you. So concluding remarks, First of all, still accurate identification of asteroids and planets suitable for mining and in situ extraction and space mining uh, is there, but they have many challenges to be resolved, especially adapting the techniques that are used on the earth for microgravity and vacuum conditions. But there's a lot of energy, 
Sunlight is available 24 seven. So that's not a problem, but to focus it and use it, it's still a lot of challenges. What does it mean to you and to us? That means there are many exciting research opportunities. Many of the things that, uh, for example, we have uh, uh, been working on the effect of magnetic field on microbes. We proposed it to NASA and, uh, and uh, NSF to do research in space station, but some document was not included. So the last time it was rejected, we plan to apply again, but lack of funding is a problem. Even though Columbia has a big endowment and, uh, and the School of Mines with a big endowment, it's not available for this. So lack of funding is a problem for my students and myself to all these things. <clears throat> As res why do we need to do this? Uh, that's one thing I mentioned, why to go to space? As Earth resources are becoming increasingly lower grade. So potential of my potential space mining is to be considered. Copper, we used to mine 5%. Now in the United States at least, it's like 0.2%. So a lot of tonnage has to be handled, and this is a problem. But there are techniques, optical techniques that should work in space, magnetic, electrostatic, and wettability-based. I showed from the center glance slides, and wettability-based techniques are there. But most favorite, mine is biological, bio biological or biological, depending upon which, which part of the world you where do you come from, biological or biological techniques. But most importantly, our, my own group has been always interested in using mixed reagent and hybrid techniques. Not one technique, you have to use a combination of techniques. But most important challenge and research opportunity is to modify conventional techniques for microgravity conditions. Let me, let me repeat that. The important challenge, as well as therefore research opportunity for your institute, as well as for us to modify the techniques that are well developed on Earth for other planets, or planets depending upon the planet, the gravity, the and uh, everything will be different. So to modify it, that is where the most opportunity is. I think that is the end of end of my talk. So I'll stop here and he'll be glad to answer questions. I'm not an expert in space. You know, we are all, as Sini knows, professors are also actors. We act, but I am passionate. You know, let me tell whoever is listening, in addition to the knowledge, passion is most important. If you if we have passion, you can do anything. Right now, you wouldn't believe, I so saw in your introductory, some people are playing instruments. I took up flute. I don't know how to play flute. You need a lot of lung capacity. I don't have it, but I'm passionate. So in one year, maybe I'll call you, invite you all for what is known as Arangetam. Sini knows Arangetam is the inaugural performance where you invite everyone. So anyway, passion is most important. With passion and funding, uh, you can we, can, we can climb mountains and even Himalayas and the mountains on Mars and other planets. Let's stop here. As I said, I don't know. Dr. Dr. Saunders, a number of questions um, okay. coming in through the Q&A, and I'm just gonna read them from the top if, if that's okay from you. Okay. Okay, so um, Indiana writes, given the violent history of colonization and the current age of decolonization in academia, can you talk about the ethics or possible problems of using the term colonization for space exploration? Very, very important question, because we know we learned a lot from the colonization of India and Africa and so on, what happened there, because the people who colonized they're only interested in uh, taking the property to, to, to uh, I, I'm trying to read also, let me just one second. Uh, read the question, okay. So it is very important question. That's why we have an opportunity to design laws and regulations using international, international bodies. Uh, let me just go to the crew and two. 
we have opportunity. That's a big problem. That's a very important question. And with the United Nations, it is possible to come to have some kind of agreement. Right now, I don't think there is much going on. Maybe Space Institute and others are doing that. We have to do that now so that the problems are not there. You know, people say that uh, UK did great things for India, built railroads, educated people. You know, they built railroads because they could take the raw materials from the mines to the to the port. They educated people because they wanted a few people who can do their uh, service job. So right now is the time to, re to make regulations so that you don't just go and rape a land, rape a planet, and destroy the planet. So that's a very good question. But I don't think that effort is there. I, as far as I know, maybe United Nations, somebody has to look at it. Maybe Space Institute can take the initiative. So that's that's the that's the very important question that you have raised. Thank you, Dr. Som. Andreas writes: In the last decade, there were several companies trying to get into space mining. None of these companies actually succeeded, as they seem to get stuck in endless prototyping. Do you think there will be another phase of increased activity in this or the, the next decade, maybe in response to the current apparent shortage in rare earth minerals? I think it will be there mainly because of people like Elon Musk, Musk and others who have taken up these challenges and they have the money to do it. It won't be easy. If I, if I, do, if I do a startup, and I'm going to, I'm probably going to fail, even if I'm very as I said, you're passionate about it. But I think with people who see the money, as I said, people know that those who can conquer the space are trillionaires. And I know Musk would like to be trillionaires. So those people can succeed. Collaborative effort is what is important, but I don't think that is there yet. So I think not everybody can, but maybe a consortium of uh, of uh, uh, industrial concerns looks like Bezos and uh, uh, Musk may not be able to cooperate, but others will be able to cooperate and do it. Again, United Nations and institutes such as yours can play a role there. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Amna writes, um, thanks you for a really informative and interesting talk. And she has a couple of questions. What are the advantages to mining in microgravity specifically? The, the advantage is that some of the, first of all, some of these metals and values are disappearing on the earth mm. or under rare conditions. For example, rare earths, China blocked, China decided to put almost a, like a blockade and, 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 and it was a big problem in the United States because most of the equipment that we use, like cell phone and so on, depends upon rare earth. So the, so I think uh, uh, I think there will be uh, needs and opportunities, but we have to we have to uh, there will be challenges too. You know, they say that whenever the a new frontier is developed. Like the Western frontier is developed. You must have seen Western movies. People go and try to take up spaces. So as we, as uh, even now, Ch Chinese and others are establishing bases in moon. How are they going to divide up the area? These are, there are no international laws as far as I know. There's some understanding, but if you get there and put a flag there, so this is it's the so these are the big opportunities for the for the I was going to say politicians for politicians I don't, as we see what happened in this country I'm not a Republican or a Democrat independent I don't have much faith but some institutions such as Space Institute or others United Nations have to take care of it otherwise there will be there will be big problems but opportunities are there but the laws and the you can't depend upon people. Once they get to a place like Mars with a lot of uh, precious stones that I, I showed, they are going to say, this is my land. And there are going to be fights. There are going to be 
they are going to be uh, Star Wars like type fight. That's why Trump developed a space force because his administration expected there will be conflicts. So now is the time to develop all the laws and regulations. And I think UAE and uh, Abu Dhabi being in the Middle East mm. has more opportunity than US or China or Russia, because you are more neutral than others. And India too. That's a very good point, Professor, very good point. Um, Amna also wanted to, and I think you touched upon this a little bit already, to understand, she wants to know what are the potential harms that can arise from space mining and how can we mitigate for this? The main harm is the harm that we already have from mining of Earth. A lot of mined, mined area, the, especially from open pit mining, are all polluted, acid mine drainage, uh, not only in the United States, but everywhere in China. When I visited Kuming, I know there was a lake. They said, you can't go there. It is, it is toxic. But there was somebody fishing. But apparently that is the harm that if we don't do it properly, we are likely to pollute the area. You can, you see, you can see the space junk that is already there. Millions of tons of space junk. Because there are no rules. They just throw it out into the space, but I think that those things have to be, that we control. So I would say the biggest challenge is like we polluted the, the earth and the, and the Lord became angry, whichever Lord you believe in, angry, and has all kinds of uh, uh, crisis, uh, climate problems, we could have there. But, so now is the time to, we may not, we may not, Think of all the potential problems, at least some of these problems that you raised in these questions and to solve it. And I don't know whether you have a branch in Swiss Institute. I'll be happy to come and collaborate. Uh, Tamara tells me how nice it is there. And uh, I'll be work, glad to work with Srini. But these are important questions that you've raised, important policy questions. And you can't expect solutions from the politicians. It's, I mean, at least politicians here who are there, congressmen who are there only for two years, president who is only for four years. So it has to be an institute like Space Institute, which has to take up, take this up and uh, make the laws in United Nations maybe, uh, in, uh, near you, Geneva. Uh, that, that is the opportunity that you have in addition to recovering materials from planets. Mm. Um, Andrew asks um, an, an interesting question. Um, and he's wondering if um, it's possible in terms of taking a, a small near earth asteroid and bringing it to earth for mining purposes rather than mining in space. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And it has been suggested as to what do you do with asteroids? You can either take bring it to earth or I had a slide where, which I removed. You can build some small colonies uh, around the, in, in the space, space stations, colonies, where you process these things. Most probably that will be the most uh, feasible technique because to transport to Earth and from Earth, it has, takes a lot of energy. So I think the first step will be to, to build some colonies, space colonies, one for processing, one for um, the, uh, for people to live, entertainment and some of the space colonies is where these things can be hauled in and developed. And in some cases, we may have to be very, very precious like diamonds, you may have to bring it to Earth. Even though, I don't know, if you bring all the uh, diamond, all the gold, it won't happen at the, on, the, on one day, then the price will go down so much. So, <laughs> but you have to bring it little by little. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, there will be, you know, market balance. So I think it's a good good point. You can bring it to Earth, or better yet, I would say bring it to a, a colony, a space platform that one can build. Great, thank you. Um, Bertoz is asking, and I, I'm not sure if this is clear, but let's try. How much benefit from space operations would convince global leadership to collaborate on large initiatives? such as agreeing on multinational space elevator projects instead of competing for resources as it happens on Earth. 
Do you think it'll ever be possible or do we need to wait for each country on its own or a small international effort to sponsor such a project by themselves? I, I think it is possible. I used to think it is not possible, but having seen the cooperation in running the International Space Station, even though now they are fighting, International Space Station, there was good cooperation between United States and, uh, and China and even Japanese went there. So it is possible if you keep can keep the politicians out, it is possible to come in come to some agreement. If the international space operation example was there, I would have been doubtful. But even the even the climate accord, they are coming to some accord, even though whether they're sufficient or not. So it is possible okay. if you know who, who who will decide the population. Population is the world population demands through United Nations and through their own countries, it can happen. The leaders have to be forced. To do it, to do it, or institutions like space institutes, or, or I know. By the way, uh, most of the major schools around here has space operation institute or centers. Not Colombia, but these there. There's no consortium. I think it may be up to senior somebody to have a consortium to answer, to act on some of these questions. We developed a consortium, I think, Srini. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Son. Those are all the questions that have come in through the Q&A. I really en enjoyed it and I hope to come and directly give a talk and hope to spend, well, like Srini is doing, I should be able to do it, spend a month there during the my sabbatical. It's a, it's a, you know, as I said, it's a dream for uh, anyone in Kerala to spend time in some of these countries. My own uncles and cousins uh, worked in Muscat, Bahrain, and so on. But their aim was to make money and come back and build, build these mansions in which, as I said, their grandmothers walk and fall because they build these bathrooms with tiles which they're not used to. But uh, so my own dream is to visit the place and enjoy. Can you hear me, Son? Yes, very well. Okay, finally I got through. I lost you for the last 10 minutes or so. I'm very sorry, I apologize for the computer problems, internet problems. I'm sorry I missed the questions and everything. Um, I guess it's still going on, is that right? Or is the end of the uh, end of the session? Tamara? We have completed answering the Q&A that have come in. And okay. so Dr. They asked very good questions. You have yes. some very good people there, very intelligent questions, questions yeah. that you should read. And I, th I think Space Institute has a role to play in uh, solving many of these problems. These are global international cooperations required. And the and it is, somebody asked uh, me Srini, a question as to whether it's possible. After seeing the cooperation in the in International Space, Space Station, and in climate control, I think it is possible. And the and the population and the uh, and the institute like yours have to push the politicians to do it. Then you know, it is possible. Thank you for raising our awareness, and um, you are welcome to come visit us and spend some time uh, with us when um, you have the time. So I'm very grateful to you for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, all, most of the audience stayed on um, uh, until the very end, it looks like. So I have um, um, nothing more to add except to say thank you so much again. Thank and you. I look forward to seeing you in Abu Dhabi in person when it is possible. I want to thank the Institute uh, for organizing your uh, talk, Nahid and... Uh, and uh, Shannon and other people, and also Tamara for her help in holding everything together. So with this, um, uh, please consider this uh, session closed. Thank you. So Thank I will you. write you separately. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye. Nice.